Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are the group six, which is formed by Queen Yuan Lee, Kevin Sams, and Sao Ning Wan, and myself, Jeffrey Shan. And today we will talk about uh, hierarchical text conditional image generation with click latent. This is a work by OpenAI, by Alex Nichols and collaborators. Uh, to start, I will explain the outline. I will start uh, uh, talking about the background motivation. Later on, uh, Saoni will start uh, talking about the methods. He will discuss the overall method, prior, decoder. Then Lee, at the, uh, later, will be discuss the image manipulation. And Kevin will discuss the text to image generation analysis, why the priors matter, uh, Glide versus Dali, diversity, fidelity, trade-off with guidance. And at the end, he will state the limitations. Okay, uh, to start with the background and motivation. Uh, this paper is about text to image generation. In text to image generation, you start with a prompt. For example, a panda mad scientist mixing sparkling chemicals, comma, are stationed. And then uh, from that input, your model should be able to create a photorealistic image, so that's this one. In order to generate this image, the model needs to understand the concept on the text, for example, panda, scientist, and chemicals. And then uh, I make association in the uh, in the text uh, domain and translate that to the image dom uh, to a, into the image domain and generate a photorealistic image. Another characteristic of this problem is that from a, a single prompt you can generate multiple uh, images. Uh, the community have been using a diffusion model for this because the diffusion models are powerful to do photorealistic images. Uh, this is a, like a, a diagram of a photo uh, of a diffusion model introduced by diffusion models built by GAN on image synthesis by Nichols and Rafula. Uh, here you have as an input the diffusion time step and, and the noise image XT, and the output is the denoise image XT. This is just a regular diffusion model, but if you want to have more control, uh, you also can you can also add the class. Uh, the class to the diffusion model in order to control what's the content of this image. In conditional uh, diffusion model, usually it's trained using classifier free guidance, where basically you uh, create your uh, denoise image as a mix of unconditional uh, generation and the conditional generation. In order to do that, uh, you have the conditional with the class. But also, if you want to do the unconditional, you introduce the null uh, class here. Uh, with that, you you mix both and then create uh, your denoise image. Uh, last week, uh, uh, we talked about Glide. Basically, in Glide, uh, they adapt this problem of uh, conditional division model so it, uh, to be more suitable, suitable with uh, text to image generation, but substituting uh, the class vector by encoded text. Now, uh, you have like a a text prompt, so it's a, a corgi with a birthday hat. You pass through a text encoder, bird-like encoder, transformer, and you have your encoder text. Uh, put that as an input for your uh, diffusion model and then create uh, photorealistic images. Now, this also was trained as a, with a classifier-free guidance where they substitute the Y with the caption here. Uh, in the same fashion, you end up with a, with a similar formula here. Another component of this work is uh, clip. In clip, you you use a uh, uh, you have a, a, a data set of captions and images, and then you have two encoder, one with text and one with image. Uh, the, you train your text encoder and your image encoder to to maximize the similarity between the image and the and the corresponding text. A, a, a good characteristic of the clip is that they are powerful for zero shot prediction. If you want to do a zero shot prediction, you basically collect your data set of your new classes. You create a text, for example, a photo of uh, the, your, your new class. Uh, for example, a photo of a dog, then you uh, transfer that to the encoders. And then if you have a new image uh, that you want to predict, you basically do argmax um, based on the similarity with the text. And for example, in this one, the winning was a photo of a dog. This is important for this work because uh, you can see that this image encoder, text encoder have the capability to learn uh, concepts beyond the training example. 
and this is uh, and this is important when you want to have a diversity in your image generation. Uh, this is not the first work using clip for a diffusion model or the text uh, to image generation. In fact, uh, last week, uh, the Glide paper also uh, used clip guidance uh, in, in their method. In clip guidance, basically, they have the same uh, Glide model here where they have to encode text, diffusion times that, and the noise images input. They create a first denoise de image. Then from this denoise image, they compute the uh, clip, uh, clip image encoder. And they also compute the caption clip text encoder, compute the dot product, um, also uh, compute them with that, compute the clip gradient. You can see here we have the clip gradient. Uh, after you have the clip gradient compute with the denoise image, you add them together and create your next uh, uh, denoise image for the next uh, step. Uh, from Glide, we learned that classifier-free guidance was better than clip guidance. This is a little bit disappointed because uh, we can see the power, the power that clip has that they mix uh, these two domain text and image. But this result showed that classifier-free guidance was better than clips. This motivated this work. Basically, the research of this group uh, asked themselves how we can use uh, clip more effectively to improve the generation. Uh, a straightforward approach is basically instead of using just uh, text encoding from the uh, text encoder that Glide has, we can use a clip uh, text encoder, feed that to the Glide decoder and create the generations. But they found that the generation were okay, but they weren't great generation, right? Uh, but also this research were interesting too. Okay, what happened if we uh, input image embeddings? And they found that if you fit, uh, use image embedding in your Glide and decoder, they lead to better generations. And this is interesting because I'll tell you train clip to be uh, a, to be these two embeddings uh, be uh, overlapping or uh, align. In, pra in, pra in, in the real world, these two uh, Latin space are not aligned. And this is a problem if you want to create a good generation. Then this work, uh, but also, Another thing is like our problem is uh, it's how we go from text to image generation, but there's no uh, method here that do connection. And this is the motivation of this work. Basically, they, they, we create a model. The, this paper talk about creating a model that take uh, uh, text embedding and outputs or predict image embeddings. Now I will leave you with Eric to explain the method. All right, uh, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'll talk about uh, more detail of the Dell E2 method and like go into detail how they implement uh, the, you know, the overall architecture. So uh, the name is, they, they call in the paper called Unclip and in general, we call it Dell E2, but these two refers to the same thing as paper. The paper consists of two parts. The first part is a prayer. Uh, which converts the uh, output from the clip text encoder and convert it into a image image embedding like uh, previous slide say. And the second part is the decoder where it takes that from the pr uh, the prayer and use the decoder to decode it into the image we want to generate. Uh, I'll talk about the prayer first. Uh, so in, in the paper, they have two methods to uh, to construct the prayer, one is use the auto regressive prayer, where they mix the text embedding into a series of data and use the auto regressive model to predict the image data, uh, the following image data. And the other method is called diffusion prayer, where they use a diffusion model, uh, like we learned in the class, and the the input would be the the encoded text, uh, the clip embedding, time steps, and also a noise image embedding. And they will, in the in diffusion steps, they will uh, get the output or reverted uh, image, image embedding. 
uh, since the diffusion prayer is usually have better metrics and it all, it's also so more more popular in the field than auto regressive. So we will talk. We'll be focusing on diffusion prayer here. So in the diffusion prayer, uh, they use a transformer decoder as the as the model instead of you know normal unit, and they also uh, change the way the diffusion work. Uh, the diffusion opus, like in our unit, uh, we we predict the noise in between frames, but they find out that directly predicting the denoise embedding performs better. So that's how they form the model. And at the bottom, you can see there are four inputs. Uh, this is the encoder text is the glide encoder, form the glide encoder. What they find is uh, the glide text encoder also can compile, compile meaningful information from the text itself. So they put it as the input as well. Uh, so we have the glide encoder text here. We have the clip text embedding here, and we have the, the normal components, the time step and noise, uh, noise image embedding at the bottom. So we can just keep go through the uh, the diffusion steps until we find the uh, the clip image embedding as an output. So during training, uh, uh, with the getting the data is easy. All we need to do ha have is a clip, and we have a caption and image pairs. So then we can use clip to get the ZT, which is the input, and the ZI, which the, is the ground truth of the model. Uh, the training loss is also uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, you just take the uh, uh, mean square loss between the image embedding predicted and the image embedding, uh, the original ground truth image embedding. As you can see the structure here. So training is fairly straightforward. Yeah, I, I, right. And uh, regarding the decoder, uh, decoder is a diffusion model based on glide. They uh, keep the 90% of the glide model the same. The only thing is uh, we we use clip image embedding into the process so that we ask the model, when we train the model, we ask it to uh, take consideration of the clip image embedding. And after that, we have two op samplers so that we can generate higher resolution images. Uh, what they find is in the op sampler, uh, no conditioning and no guidance works the best. So that's what they use. Uh, in the detail of the decoder unit, this is uh, just uh, the glide architecture, and and we feed the clip image embedding into each part, each block, and also the diffusion time steps. And I'll explain uh, in detail what was in the each block. So in each block, you have two residual blocks, and a, an attention layer. So the these uh, all these text and image embedding are feed into all those blocks, uh, but only the the time step are feed in the residual blocks so that you won't take the time step into attention. Uh, regarding the upsampler, uh, so after the decoder, you have a sixty four pixel image. So they just use two out of shelf upsamplers to upsample it into a higher resolution. Uh, these are basically out of shelf, so they. They didn't train anything on it. Uh, Trainer decoder is also straightforward. Uh, with this time, we don't need the text encoder. All we need is the image encoder. So we have a frozen image encoder here. We have an image, so we encode it back to the uh, uh, image embedding. Then we just use the decoder to decode it back, and we convert. Uh, then we calculate the MSC loss in between those images to train the decoder. Uh, during uh, last but not least, during the inference, is uh, the the process is uh, quite clear right now. So, for example, if you have a text saying a corgi playing a flamethrowing trumpet, uh, you will first use uh, the clip encoder to encode it into a clip text embedding. Then you use the prayer to convert it back to the clip image embedding, and you use the encoder. I mean, sorry, the decoder to decode it back to the image. That's basically how you generate the image with the LE2 or unclip. And Lee will talk more about uh, image manipulations and variations.
So can you unmute Lee? You, we don't hear uh, you. Lee. Lee, you are muted. Unmute. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to unmute myself. Yeah. Start all over again. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I'm going to talk about the image manipulation. So before we talk about the image manipulation, uh, we need to understand what's the latent space. The latent space basically is the information of the uh, images being compressed into some vector space, and then uh, it is represented with a number. So if we can look at the gif right here, we got two very close to the chair. And as we modify the latent space value, we slightly change it from the left chair to the right chair. And then I'm going to talk about bipartite latent representation. Uh, one with the Z, we need to take the two parameters. One is the ZI and the another one is the XT. So the AI is basically just the clip image encoding. And then the XT, the DDI inversion, which is the um, information that is stored to generate uh, to generate the final results. And now I'm going to talk about the variation of the images. So the first, we need to look at the input images. This is a very famous uh, artistic. Uh, Ellie, you froze we don't, if you're we still there. I think this internet is unstable. I think he's in a classroom too. The building has poor Wi-Fi. Uh, I'm with Lee actually right now. Uh, he wants me to let everyone know that his computer just crashed. Yeah, it just crashed his blue screen. Oh, he just ha had a blue screen issue. Um, okay, so uh, uh, um, maybe somebody can do for him, uh, Eric or. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Lee, you wanna, want to take Lee, off? Lee, you want to use Ron on this computer to do the presentation, and I can share the uh, I can share the slides for you. That works for us. I can give them access. Yeah. Thanks, man. Of course. Hey, sorry guys. Um, I I am I'm with Ron right now, so I have to use his computer. My computer just crashed for some reason. Um, it's blue screen right now. Okay, so uh, we were talking about the uh, the variation. Eric, can you move to variation? Yes. Um. Okay, so we have the input images. So this is the very famous artworks that we can see that it has some um, soft clocks and brown ground and some skies. And then we need to fix the ZI, which is the image embedding. And then we vary as the XT, which is the DDIM inversion. Next one. All right, here's the generated results. The, we have the blue skies that's being preserved. The claw is also being preserved. The ground, ground, uh, the, the brown ground is also preserved as well. And it, to look, if we observe those generated uh, results, we can see that uh, all of those information has been preserved, but the variation of those details, they're not as important as the others. Next one. And next I'm going to talk about the interpolation between the two images. So as you can see that on the image, image on the left and the image on the right, then it can, during the interpolation, this kind of star fusing of the two images together. Next. In order to do that, we need to modify the image embedding. Um, so now we will pass the image embedding of the first images and the second image into the slope algorithm, which is just a spherical interpolation. Next. Okay, then I'm talking about the text differentiation. The idea of text differentiation is we given a text and images, and then we want to update the uh, images by giving a new text. Next. And then, so now we have the two uh, text embedding, ZT and ZT0. Next. And we end up with, uh, just doing the subtraction between them to compute the difference clip embedding. And then we need to carry the image embedding as well to pass into the slope algorithm. Next one. So uh, now we have the 
the new variable z theta, which is the one that we can use to interpret the generative results. As we can see from the left, the, the house just slightly changes from one kind of style to the new styles that we just updated with the text information. Next one. All right. Then next, I'm gonna talk about the typographic attacks. This is um, with the reason why we want to test this is because we want to probe the well, what is the information that's being stored in the latent space. If we look at attack picture, the one on the left is the original picture. The one in the middle is attack with the iPod and the pizza. Basically, the typographic attack is we have an object that was attached to a big bold text on it to try to confuse the model to think that this is not an object, but instead it is the text that we attached it. Then, then we look at the clip image prediction. Um, the original image is, was, uh, has a 100% prediction for the Granny Smith. That's totally fine. Uh, but the Apple one has the 99.9A. And then for some reason, the pizza one is very persistent, is very um, resistant to the attacks. This is the predict, uh, predict, clip image prediction. And then we look at the generated result. Although that we show that this has the attack, that is being successful, um, that, but the generated result still shows the object and that does not confuse with the iPod itself. Next one. All right, then I'm going to pass uh, to Kevin that he's going to talk about a test to image generation analysis. All right. You can just... Yeah, yeah, it's back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can see my screen. Yes. Okay. So as Lee said, I'm going to talk about the text to image generation analysis. So I'll talk about why the prior matters. Uh, I'll talk about some of the test results. Then we'll go over the limitations of the model, and then we'll close. So why does why do we need a prior? Because the model is composed of two parts. It's the prior and the decoder, which they refer to collectively as the unclipped stack. And as I uh, mentioned before, the unclipped stack is also another way to say the uh, Dolly 2 architecture. So they, because they, they realize that the decoder can produce images on its own without the prior. So they looked at a couple of different scenarios and said, well, what if we run the decoder by itself? Uh, what kind of results do we get from that? So in this chart, you look at the caption, a group of baseball players is crowded at the mound. Uh, they ran the decoder by itself uh, without the prior, just the decoder on just the captions alone, and they pushed that first image. Then they tried running the decoder by itself on the caption plus the text embeddings, but fed the text embeddings to the decoder as though they were image embeddings and produced that image. And then they ran the full, uh, what they call the full unclipped stack, which is the prior and the decoder. Again, that's the Dolly 2 architecture. And they produced this image. So we can see that this image produced with, with the full stack, the prior and the decoder running uh, definitely has something to do with the, the caption, matches it pretty well. The second uh, picture has some, it, it's, it's, has some decent results to it, but it's not entirely what they're looking for. And the first image with just the decoder by itself, just the captions obviously has almost nothing to do with the caption. And we can see in some of these other images, like over in the far right here, this wire metal rack holds several pairs of shoes and sandals. Uh, the image produced with the, with the full stack, the, the prior and the decoder matches the caption. Second row, not so much. The first one has an element of what we're looking for, but obviously it's not really what we're looking for in uh, in the, in the, uh, in the caption. So obviously from this, the, they figure the prior does matter. If you, if you want to produce images that match the caption well, then you need a prior running in the, in the full stack. And uh, they figured the prior was important enough to, to look at two different options for training it, which was the auto regressive prior and the diffusion prior. As previously mentioned, they went with the diffusion prior because it produced better results. So they said as a standard, when you're testing these image production models, it's a standard to, to test them against the MS Coco data set using the FID score. And we see the guidance scale here on the bottom. That refers to the classifier free guidance that they mentioned earlier. And then the left side here, the Y axis is the MS Coco FID score. And the lower score is better. So we can see they're comparing this model, Dolly 2, to uh, Glide. We can see that all three models uh, have their best results here at, the, at this point, at this point in the guidance scale. But as you increase guidance, the uh, both versions of the unclipped stack using the, the AR prior, the auto regressive prior and the diffusion prior, uh, they don't get affected very much, but you can see with the glide model, it gets immediately and progressively worse as you uh, increase guidance. And this table kind of says the same thing, only this is a comparison of the zero shot score 
where you zero shot is where you run a model against a data set for of classes that it has not been trained on. So you can see here it glides up here at 12.24 and running zero shot uh, on the unclip stack, both versions of the unclip stack do better than Dolly. And then this is just a filter data set where there's a little more filtering the data set to remove certain kinds of images and they ran it again and, and still the both versions of the unclip stack beat uh, glide. But in human evaluation, they, they figure that the FID score does not always agree with human eva evaluation. So they perform some evaluations. They ask some human evaluators to look at uh, some images and pick either unclip or glide as the best, as their best choice, or, and they give them a third option of not sure. So that produced a number of confidence intervals where they tested it against uh, for photorealism, glide won by a small margin that produced a 48.9% confidence interval that humans, that the human evaluator would, would, would choose glide over uh, unclip, over the Dolly model. Uh, same thing for caption similarity where glide actually won by a small margin. However, in terms of sample diversity, the unclip stack was a winner by a wide margin producing a 70.5% confidence interval that uh, human evaluators would choose uh, Dolly or unclip over glide. And this, Graph, graph kind of says the same thing, but it's a little bit confusing. Um, but if we look, take a minute to look at the setup, it should be a little less confusing. So down at the bottom, again, we have the guidance scale, which refers to the uh, classifier free guidance. On the y-axis, we have the percentage uh, chance that humans would choose one model over the other. The dashed line separates the two models. If it's above the line, then unclipped, the human evaluators chose unclip, unclip as the better model. If it's below the dashed line, then they choose glide. So we can see here at a guidance of 1.0, uh, Glide wins in terms of sample diversity, but Unclip wins in terms of photorealism and caption, caption similarity. As we increase guidance up to 3.0, then uh, Unclip loses to Glide in terms of photo, in terms of caption similarity and photorealism, but wins in terms of uh, diversity. So basically what they're saying is that there's a trade-off between uh, diversity and fidelity against Glide. So Unclip does not beat Glide model in every aspect. You can beat Glide in certain aspects, but then you'll lose in others. So you kind of have to pick and choose where you want to beat Glide in order to uh, lose basically not so much, which is at, at a guide scale 3.0. They beat the Glide model in terms of diversity, but in terms of photorealism and capture similarity, they, they Glide wins, but it wins by a small margin. So basically this is their best game to produce their best results against Glide. So basically, Unclip does have better diversity and relatively good fidelity. So they also did a test for aesthetic quality. They, they built a, a clip linear probe and used it on the ABA data set, plus their images to uh, produce a more objective measurement of human aesthetic judgment. And what they found that is that guidance improves uh, both models. Both versions of the Unclip model and Glide improve with guidance. But however, when you go to recall, we take the, this is the guidance scale on the bottom. You have the AVA prediction on the right, on the left side. You take the prediction over to here and then, and then run it against recall. And you can see as guidance, as the uh, prediction increases, uh, glide gets, gets worse. However, unclip seems to be pretty stable in terms of recall. So in, so in the end, uh, glide sacrifices recall for aesthetic quality improvement, whereas unclip uh, doesn't really sacrifice much. So if regarding the limitations of the model, the model does have issues with attribute binding, where it has bind two different attributes to two different uh, objects. And we can see uh, from the caption here, a red cube on top of a blue cube. This is the red cube supposed to be on top. You have, you have blue, you have white in this picture. And here they produce this image where the red cube is supposed to be on top, but it's on the bottom. And again, here in these two, the red cube should be on top, but it winds up being on the bottom. And some of the white from the uh, start gets mixed in between them. So overall, the uh, the model does mix up objects and attributes. And the model also also struggles, they say, to produce coherent text. Uh, they said likely because the model, uh, the unclip embedding doesn't precisely include the spelling of the rendered text, and also they have they kind of some kind of a compounded problem because they also have a, a data compression algorithm that they say might be obscuring the uh, the the caption in the model. It also has issues rendering complex scenes. And you can see in this image, it looks like it's pretty done pretty well, but if you look really closely, you'll see in the fine details, there's some blurs, some mixing colors. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. They said it has issues producing complex scenes. 
uh, likely be due to their base encoding. They use a, a base resolution, or not a base encoding, but a base re resolution, a 64 by 64, and they hypothesize that they could fix this problem by increasing, just by increasing their base resolution. So in conclusion, uh, the image embedding creates a better generation than text embeddings. Uh, clip embeddings hold the concept information, while as the uh, the clip text embeddings hold the style of the image generation. And the diffusion prior is necessary to increase the fidelity of image generation. And unclip, as I said, has limitations in terms of binding attributes, uh, text generation, and, and producing complex scenes. And that's our presentation.